really great to be back with you and uh, we're uh, we're really glad to have you if you've been a regular watcher we're really thank you for watching us and uh, being a part of sharing and making comments and also if you're brand new we're really glad that uh, you've tuned in to check us out today and so I hope you have a really enjoy and get something powerful out of this this uh, I want to talk today about a topic that I really believe is very important in the time that we're going through right now and I, I want to share with you today that our world is extremely negative. Um, it's not too hard to get uh, really discouraged and depressed. Uh, and it seems to be all around us. And uh, we seem to be extremely anxious and, and concerned about things. Uh, it starts at a very young age. Um, it can start as early as, you know, kids going to school and all of a sudden you're out in the playground and we're picking teams. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been there, but been the last one picked on a team. Man, that's really discouraging. It's really frustrating. And it can really make you start to question, you know, like, how, uh, how important am I? Am I any good at anything? And, and we can have different things that happen. We can even have our loved ones in our family. You know, you kind of walk through the door after a long day of work and somebody right away complains, you, you know, like, uh, well, the lawn's not cut or, or all of a sudden, you know, the dishes aren't clean or whatever's going on. And, and so, you know what? It, it doesn't take too long. There's a little story I want to kind of share with you just for a moment here uh, that maybe... Uh, you've not heard before, but back in the colonial days, um, people that had wealthy homes, you know, that, that were wealthy, uh, were doing well, uh, they were very proud, especially the women, were very proud of their uh, oak floors. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were basically like di different planks uh, that they had, and these planks were oak, and they were wide boards. They're, they were very wide boards and they were very, um, you know, whenever they came in, they liked to, you know, people come in, they'd show them off. Kind of like what we do even when we do some remodeling and put in some new laminate floor or whatever. But these were solid oak. And these uh, wealthy wives of the owner of the home uh, would just literally do is they would have their servants wash those, those planks, uh, that flooring. And what they would do is they would have a wet mop or a wet rag and they would go down and they would rub uh, those oak uh, boards and then they would follow up with a dry rag or mop and they would rub them till they shine and you could almost see your face in them they would get them so good and it was the pride of of these wealthy ladies but occasionally uh, they would they would teach the servants to do this and the servants would realize and this is so important they would when you're washing it you had to wash with the grain of the flooring so of that plank you would wash with the grain and then you would dry with the grain and then it would bring out an unbelievable shine but sometimes there would be those servants that really were taking a shortcut or maybe were, weren't really skilled at it and they would wash the floor from side to side not going with the grain but across the grain and unbelievably when you start washing and drying like that across the grain it brings out a dull and I don't know if you understand this, but there is a saying that we use occasionally now uh, that really came from that when uh, the wife would come in and she would see that the servant had done it wrong. They usually would get very upset and say, you don't know how to wash these. You don't know how to rub them. And we get to realize that this woman would come out and she would say, you are rubbing the floor the wrong way to that servant. That's what she would say. Do you know that we get the saying, you rub somebody the wrong way from that example of what was going on there? That's where that example came to us. Do you rub somebody the wrong way? I guarantee that somebody has rubbed you the wrong way. May have even rubbed you the wrong way this morning when you got up. But literally, somebody's rubbed you the wrong way. And hang on, hang on. I know this is going to be hard for you to believe. But I believe you may have rubbed somebody the wrong way. I know you're saying, not me, Pastor. I would never be like that. But come on, if we're really honest with ourselves, we have probably rubbed somebody the wrong way.
See, unfortunately, our human nature is such that we are more quick to tear somebody down than we are to lift somebody up or to encourage them. And that's what I want to talk about today, being an encourager. Um, we can all discourage people. Uh, it doesn't take much to do that. Uh, but can we be someone that encourages, brings comfort and kindness to others? So uh, I want you to think about this. Around us is continually those that are criticizing us, those that are tearing us down. Uh, it can happen anywhere, uh, by anybody. But we need to know that God has called us to be encouragers. And literally, it, it can be a spiritual gift. The Bible talks about encouragement being a spiritual gift. Just like love, just like kindness, although it's a spiritual gift, patience, long-suffering. It's a spiritual gift. Now, we're all called to be encouragers, but there are those that are, it's a gift that God has given them, and it just seems to flow from them with no effort and, and no difficulty. So let's get started here uh, as we look at this whole part on encouragement. The first place I want to start with is this. God is an encourager. 2 Corinthians, uh, reading out of the ERV, which is the easy to read version, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5 to 6 says this. Paul is talking about God to the Corinthians. And he says, when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest. They were physically tired. We found trouble all around us. Now, I want to tell you, how many of you feel like that too? How many of you feel that you're exhausted, you're tired? This is what Paul was saying. We're, it seems like we're battling everything. And it seems like there is trouble all around us. And he goes on to say, we found trouble all around us. We had fighting on the outside and we had fear on the inside. Oh my goodness, I think that's describing a lot of our lives. It just seems like everything is, is coming at us from the outside. And inside, we just, we're just going like, I don't know if I can take another step. I don't know if I can keep pressing on. I don't know if I can do anything else. And I love verse 6. This is the key. But God. But God. Right? Like, highlight it in your Bible. But God encourages those who are troubled. And he certainly encouraged us by bringing Titus to us. So what was that all about? Paul was saying, we've got all these people trying to tear us down as Christians. You know, he was bringing the gospel and people were complaining about him. People were going after him because of his good things that he was doing and everything else and the rest of the disciples. And in fact, many of them lost their jobs because they became Christians. Uh, and all these things were going on, and in them they were fearful, always wondering, are they going to put us in prison? What's going to happen? All of these different things were going on. And literally, God sent Titus, another godly man, into Paul's life to bring encouragement, to lift him up. Our God cares about you. Our God wants to bring encouragement isn't it crazy that you can be down and out and all of a sudden you'll listen to a worship song and it'll lift you up? There's something in the song where God will use that artist to bring, you know, encouragement to you. There's times, I don't know if you've ever done this, but you're going through a difficult time and all of a sudden you open up your Bible and you're reading your Bible and it's just like the Bible was reading your mail. It just literally comes alive and is speaking about the situation that you're going through. That's God encouraging you. See, we serve a God who encourages those that are discouraged. And therefore, if our God is a God of encouragement, He resides within us, we are to be encouragers too. We are to be imitators of God. So if God is an encourager, when God sets into our prayer time, when God comes when we feel like nobody cares and He comes in and He, he just pours into us encouragement, we need to know that we are to represent Him. We are to reflect Him. And so I'm saying, to you today as a child of God we're called to be encouragers as well I want to encourage you to be that encourager today because you have no idea what a simple you know like 
a message of encouragement can do to somebody when they're going through a difficult time. You, you may not even realize what a smile would do for somebody, uh, or just taking some time for somebody, or just, you know, being there to listen to them, what they're going through, will lift them up. Let me just share with you out of Hebrews. Hebrews 3, verse 13. Hebrews 3, verse 13 says, But encourage each other every day while you still have something called today. In other words, you need to be encouraging people every day as long as you're alive. Help each other so that none of you will be will be fooled by sin and become hard to change. Every single day we should be a tool of God and a voice of encouragement to other people that are around. I don't know if you want it, Hebrews 10, if you, you got your Bibles open or you got your tablets open, Hebrews 10 goes on to add to this even a, a little bit more. It says, Hebrews 10 Verse, tw uh, verse 24 to 25 says, We should think about each other to see how we can encourage each other to show love, to show good works. Verse 25 says, We must not quit meeting together as some are doing. No, we need to keep on encouraging each other. This because it becomes more and more important as a day gets closer. As the closer of the return of Christ is coming, this scripture is saying we are going to be more discouraged. We are going to get frustrated with the political realm and the economy and the cost of living and, and people's choices. And we're going to feel so discouraged and frustrated and just go like, I, I don't know which way to turn. I'm, I, everything's coming from every, outside on me and I am filled with fear. But the reality is he is encouraging us in Hebrews 10 Keep encouraging every day. Keep loving each other. Do good works for each other. Think about ways that God can use you. I got a great example for you if you've got your Bibles. Acts chapter 4. And I'm going to read that for you. Acts chapter 4. There was a man. His name was Joseph. But the apostles called him Barnabas. And really, that word Barnabas will give you the details of it. Why he got called Barnabas by the apostles is kind of like a nickname for him. But he is a great example of an encourager. So in Acts chapter 4, uh, four let's hear what's kind of going on here in verse 32. A whole group of believers was united in their thinking and in what they wanted. None of them said that the things that they had were their own. Wow, there was quite a, quite a change that happened. In. Instead, they shared everything. With great power, the apostles were making it known to everyone that the Lord Jesus Christ raised from the dead. They were, they were sharing the gospel. Power, they were doing miracles. Everything was happening. They were all in unison. What was happening is anything they had, they sold and they brought it together and they looked after everybody. You need to understand, as I said earlier, Many of the apostles, many of those that were the leaders of preaching the gospel at that time, lost their jobs. And so what ended up happening to them was they had no income. And so what ended up happening was these people, these group of people, would bring finances in to pay for these apostles, to care for them. So they had food and they had a home and they had all those things that they needed. Kind of like what you do when you tithe the church, it pays my salary and Pastor Trevor's salary. We, we don't get paid anywhere else. It's through the giving of the church family. It goes on to say, and God blessed all the believers very much. None of them could say they needed anything. By being faithful to each other, by caring for each other, God just poured out blessings on them. Everyone who owned fields and houses sold them. They, kind of like what's going on in our economy right now, people are selling houses left and right and getting big bucks. They, they, bought, they brought their money uh, and they got and gave it to the apostles. Then everyone was given whatever they needed. One of the believers was named Joseph. The apostles called him Barnabas. And here it is, a name that means one who encourages others. 
He was a Levite born uh, in, in Cyprus. Joseph sold his field uh, that he owned and he brought the money and gave it to his apostles. Now listen, I'm not telling you to go out and sell your, your house and bring your money to the church. And I'm not telling you to go sell your field and everything else. Like that. But, but God's got a principle of supporting the church. And he's also got a principle of tithing. And uh, that comes out of our, our salary, what we make when we're working or what we're paid uh, that comes in this. Barnabas, the, and that's a whole other message on giving, but I want to talk about encouragement. Barnabas spoke up. They called him that, that he was an encourager because... We need to understand this. Paul was, was speaking here, but the reality that comes, Paul's name was Saul before. He was Saul of Tarsus. He had persecuted many of the Christians in Jerusalem where he was coming to. Now, we need to understand what happened here. Saul had an encounter with God and ends up finding Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He becomes a Christian, a follower of God. Now, he had gone into Jerusalem. When he came into Jerusalem, he would go around and he would grab up all the Christians and he would throw them into jail. He would have them whipped. He would have them stoned. He did all of those things. In fact, he was right there when Stephen was stoned and he was a part of holding all the cloaks. And he made this his job. He was going to rid the world of Christians. Now he has an encounter where he, he meets up with God in a supernatural way and he turns his life around and becomes a Christian. Now he wants to come back and come alongside the Christians and help spread the gospel. He comes into Jerusalem and wants to go into the churches. He wants to help the Christians and right away the Christian, whoa! No way, man. Don't get near this guy. He's just, he's going to set us up. He, he's saying he's a Christian, but he wants to get in there so that he can find out who the Christians are, and then he's going to throw us in jail. They didn't want anything to do. They rejected him all the time. But, but Barnabas, he took Saul under his wing. He, he saw him. He had heard about uh, that he had got, became a Christian. He had heard the story. And he connected with him and brought him to the, the Christians uh, in, the, in Jerusalem there and said, listen, he's not the same guy. He's changed. So when he tried to connect, uh, he had no luck. But when Barnabas came, he gave him a chance. The church grew. See, Barnabas was saying, uh, the church is growing, but this guy, Paul, he is so eloquent in speech. He understands all of this stuff. He is a great speaker. He could be a benefit to these churches. And so he was concerned about these churches growing, and he was willing to spend time with Saul to make sure that he was okay. So all of a sudden, Barnabas was named for his spiritual gift. It reflected his character. In Romans 12, 8, it says... If your gift is encouragement, devote yourself to encouraging. Barnabas' gift was encouraging, and so he couldn't do anything but want to encourage. And see, that Greek word means to call to or to come alongside of. We are called to come alongside of those that are depressed and those that are downhearted and rejected. And that's what Barnabas was doing with Saul. And that's what we're called to do with people that we see by the power of the Holy Spirit that are depressed and rejected and have been beaten up. It has the idea kind of of coming to the aid or the assistant of someone to help somebody in an area where they can't even help themselves. That's what encouragement is. That same word, encouragement, that was used there in Romans also is the same one that was used in John 14, verse 16 to 18. Take some time to read that. But that was when Jesus was going to be crucified and he came to the disciples and he says, hey, I am going to be leaving, but I'm going to send a comforter to you. That word encouragement there was the same word that Jesus was speaking of, of the Holy Spirit. We have an encourager that not only comes alongside us, but is in us, and that's the Holy Spirit. We are commanded to be encouragers. It's not just a choice thing. It's supposed to be a part of our identity, our characteristic. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says this, 
It says, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. See, Barnabas sponsored an unpopular convert, Saul. Last time he was in Jerusalem, he was causing havoc but, and putting people in prison. Now he returns and Barnabas takes him alongside and says, I'll vouch for him. I've got him. To the believers of Jerusalem, he was public enemy number one. Barnabas brought Saul to the apostles and told him his story of conversion. See, the early church looked at Saul and saw a problem. Barnabas looked at Saul and what did he see? He saw incredible potential. I love it. That's what we're called to do. We're called to pull the gold out of people where rejection and being beat up and all those things coming at them have made them feel they're worth nothing. The early church saw his past. Barnabas saw his future. The early church saw what he had been. Barnabas saw what he could be. And that's what God is calling us to do as encouragers. We need to see potential. We need to look for the future in people. We need to focus on them, even if they've gone difficult times. How do we welcome new people into our church? Maybe they don't dress like we do. Maybe they still have habits. Maybe after church is done, they're going out to have a cigarette. Or, or, or maybe the F word slips out every once in a while. They're not there yet. Neither are we, to be really honest with you. But how do we care for it? Do we encourage them? Or do we brush them off and say, we don't want to be around them. They're like an enemy to us. We can learn a lot from Barnabas and we can learn a lot from God's word. Barnabas never wrote a word in the Bible as far as we know. But isn't it something that his words of encouragement caused Saul, who then was named Paul, to write, what, 13 books in the Bible. 13 books were written because Barnabas encouraged Paul to keep in the ministry and to keep doing what he was being called to do. And then he not only did that, if you read on, there was a story where he spoke to John Mark when everybody wanted to throw John Mark out because he didn't stick it. Even Paul forgot what he had learned and, and didn't want to minister with John Mark. Mark Barnabas said, I'll take him on cruise. I'll take him out with me going to evangelize and do different things. And doesn't he write a gospel? 14 books in the Bible from a man that we don't think ever wrote anything, but his encouragement went on. Then there's times where, you know, we get discouraged ourselves. And we need to call up. We need to, we need to encourage ourselves. We need to turn around and we say, God, I, I feel discouraged. I feel frustrated. And we need to take time, a quiet time with God. We need to take some time with Him and just say, God, come and encourage me. God, pour into me. I am perfectly made. God doesn't make any mistakes. God is bigger than anything that comes in my life. God is my encourager. He is there for it. God will supply all of my needs. God, if you're with me, who can be against me? My God is working all things for good. I don't know what you're doing right there, but that should be getting you off your couch and getting you dancing up on the cushions because our God has us and we need to sometimes talk to ourselves and let ourselves know who we are in Christ. Let me just pull this together with a story real quickly. There was a, there was a boy, his dad uh, died when he was five years old. He, he dropped out of school at grade six. And by the time he was 17, he had lost job after job. He got married at 18 years of age. He had a baby at 19 and he was separated by the age of 20. Man, he, he had battles going on all around him. He became a railway conductor only to get fired. He became a farmer only to lose his shirt. He tried to go to school as for a lawyer, but couldn't make it and ended up being rejected. Finally, because he became a dishwasher and a cook in a very small in-the-wall kind of restaurant, he persuaded his wife to come back and they, they re reunited in their marriage and then they both worked in the restaurant cleaning dishes and cooking in the kitchen. At 65, he came to a place to retire and he received his first social security check of $105. He was so disappointed with his life. He was so discouraged. And you might be sitting here today listening to me feeling the same way. So discouraged that he thought of taking his life. And he went out and sat under a tree and started writing his last will and testament. 
Somehow, we don't know how, his wife found out his plans uh, to take his life. And she came to him and she comforted him and she said, let me tell you something you can do and you can do it well. You can cook better than anyone else I have ever seen or ever tasted food as good as you cook. Oh man, that word of encouragement went right into his heart. It gave him some to to, to it gave him some incentive not to give up but to continue to try. And he went to the bank and he took out $87 uh, from his social security check and he went to the supermarket and he bought some chicken and boxes and he fried up the chicken with a special recipe that he had developed for himself for these chickens that he would cook in the restaurant. Then he put those chickens in the boxes and he went door to door in Corbin, Kentucky selling chicken. It became so popular that he tried to go to the restaurants and offer to make his chicken for the restaurants and sell it there. But the restaurants refused him one after another after another. All of a sudden, a man came along that tasted his chicken and went, listen, man, this is the best chicken I have ever eaten in my life. I want to partner up with you to make this unbelievably across the nation, across the United States. Come on, you may have already figured it out. Maybe I can give you another hint. Look at this. The boy I was talking about, the guy I was talking about, this is his company. Now, I want you to know that man that invested into him, invested into this man. That man was Colonel Sanders, the founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken, thinking at one point to take his life because he was so discouraged. Ready to give everything up, but the word. He, what's the secret of this whole story? The word of encouragement from his wife when he was ready to end it all. See, if you want to rub people the right way and cause them to shine, be an encourager. Be an encourager. Sons and daughters of encouragement are not born. For some of it's a spiritual gift. It comes naturally. It's God placed in them. But we're all called to be encouragers. We're called to ask the Holy Spirit to look at us and say, Holy Spirit, allow me to see people that are, that are feeling squeezed in, people that are depressed, people that are rejected, people that are being beaten. And you might be one of those people. So I want to say, God, raise up someone to come into your life to be an encourager for you. Let's pray. God, let us recognize the voice of encouragement to those who are discouraged and those that are hurting. There are probably those that are hurting that are listening to me right now. God, raise up encouragers to come into their life and encourage them. And if there isn't one coming, God, rise up in them for them to pray to you and ask you to bring encouragement. Bring somebody like Paul had Titus come into the life. But if you can't have somebody come into your life, start getting into the word, get into the worship music. Let God encourage you through what he has for you. Because God loves you. God cares cares about you. You are important to God. If you desire to be used, call out to God and say, God, today I want to be an encourager. Holy Spirit, let me see those people that are hurting and discouraged. That new person that walks through the church, I want to be an encourager. God, I know what it felt like when I had my hair done and somebody came and criticized my new haircut, or I got a new outfit and somebody made a judgment call and said it wasn't that good looking on me, or I was too big to be wearing that tight of a dress or something, or, or shirt didn't really suit my, my color, or whatever. I don't want to be that person. I want to be the encourager, the person that's going to come alongside that person and lift them up when they feel they can't even lift themselves up. So God, I just pray right now, whoever is listening to this voice would become encouragers and would be looking for opportunities to be able to help one another and lift people up. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.